here we are. The holidays have come and gone. Blue Monday is coming. They go by too fast, don't they? And our expectations are rarely met. They never quite live up to the hype. The new wears off so quickly and then it's back to the grind. It really is. The, the quickness and the disappointment of the holidays really are a good metaphor for life. At least for life east of Eden. Isaiah 64, the prophet says, we fade like a leaf. And our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. Job chapter 14 says, man who is born of woman is few of days and full of trouble. Few of days and full of trouble. So I just want us to reflect on it a little bit here in the new year. We're going to be looking at one verse in the book of Psalms. So if you open your Bible to Psalm chapter 90, if you don't have a Bible, grab one of ours there and chair in front of you or turn on in your phone to Psalm chapter 90 and we're just going to look at verse 12. It's a prayer, it's a psalm of Moses. Psalm 90 verse 12. The Spirit of God would have us hear these words this morning. So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. It's a prayer. It's a psalm, but it's a prayer because the reality is we need help from God for this. And so we ask him, Lord, teach us. Lord, this can't come from us. We need your help. Lord, on our own, we can't get there. And so would you teach us to number our days? You must intervene here and help us get where you want us to be. And so you must teach this lesson to us. It's a prayer. And what is the prayer? Lord, teach us to number our days. Teach us to realize the brevity of life. Or teach us, show us our mortality. Instruct us, Father, on the fact that we will not live forever. This sort of reality, this sort of prayer is actually all over the scripture. Psalm 39, verse 4. O oh Lord, make me know my end and what is the measure of my days. Let me know how fleeting I am. Do you ever pray like that? Lord, remind me of my feebleness. Let me know how fleeting I am. Imagine if you did pray like that, though. Lord, help us to know that our end is on its way. Lord, help me to believe that death is coming. Here's how Ecclesiastes puts it in chapter 7. It says that the day of death is better than the day of birth. It says this, it's better to go to the house of mourning... Morning, M-O-U-R, not like morning and evening, but morning. It's better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. And so God's word tells us it's better to think about your death day than your birthday. Do you believe that? Death is the end of all mankind. All die because all sin. That's the reason. We have a really easy explanation for why death is a reality. It's because of sin. It's our wage, right? The wages of sin is death. We have earned it. And so all die because all, all have sins. You know, we talk a lot about survival stories. Last night, I watched this really gnarly video. I love great white sharks. I've, one time, at some point, I want to go swim with great white sharks. Not any sharks, just great whites. And so last night, Alicia showed us a video where there's a guy like in a clear, clear cage. And uh, man, just what, how cool that would be. A 16-footer, well, the 16-footer broke through. Comes up from the bottom. He didn't know it was coming. Broke through the glass cage and tossed. I would love that. I would love that. If you had to choose a way to go, it'd be being attacked by a great white shark. Well, what'd they say? It was a survival story. But here's the thing. Here's the reality. There's no survival stories. That brother survived that one. It's just a delay story. There's delay stories. There really are no survival stories because all have sinned and therefore all will die. And so we pray, Lord, grant us awareness of our mortality. It's uncomfortable, I realize. If you've been here a lot, though, you're getting used to it by now, being uncomfortable. 
But let's do a thought experiment. It's one that I've done with you before, a little different. But you don't have to raise hands or answer here, but just do a thought experiment with me. How many of you are close to your grandparents? The vast majority of you probably were close to your grandparents. In an ideal world, very close, right? They were influential to you probably. Now just think, let's just pick on grandma for a moment. Do you know her father's name? Her grandfather, do you know? Your grandfather's really influential to you probably, maybe still is. Do you know his father's name? His first name. The vast majority of humans don't even know the name of their great-grandfather, much less what he was about, what he did, what his passions were. Now flip it around. If you have a family, if you have kids, your kids, Lord willing, they'll have grandkids. And I hope your kids are hugely influential for good in the lives of their grandkids. And, you know, most of them won't even know your name. And I hope you are very influential in the lives of their grandkids. Life is short. Lord, teach us. Teach us this. Teach us that life is short. Lord, teach us to number our days. That's the prayer. Lord, teach us about the brevity of life. And what kind of heart prays this kind of prayer? Well, someone who's come to realize the brevity of life. Someone who knows it. Which should be all of us. It's part of my job to remind us of that. I've got many job descriptions, but one line of my job description is to prepare you for a good death. To help you finish well. Someone who knows about it. Someone who knows the brevity. What kind of heart prays this kind of prayer? Someone who knows that death is coming. Someone who knows that days are short. Someone who knows, as the brother of Jesus says, James chapter 4, that life is a vapor. It's a mist. Few of days. Someone who knows that we will soon be in the tomb. What kind of heart prays this kind of prayer? The kind of person who knows God. Who communes with God. Has a relationship with God. Someone who knows that God hears Someone who knows eternity is long. Someone who's centered on God, not on the self. That's the kind of person who prays this kind of prayer. Lord, teach us to number our days. But that's not all it says. The prayer has a goal. There's a word, there's a purpose word in there, that. Lord, teach us to number our days so that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Wise hearts. And remember how scripture views the heart? It's not just an organ that pumps blood. In Scripture, the heart is the causal core of our personality. It's the executive center of the self. It's the motivational headquarters. Heart in Scripture is this big term. It's a comprehensive term for the personality as a whole. And so we need to number our days to change who we are at the core. It's a composite of our mind and our will and our emotions. And to number our days, to have death awareness, it changes who we are. Fundamentally, it changes who we are. At the roots. Sidebar, I think one of the reasons believers of yesteryear, I think of the Puritans, for example, but many other from other time periods, just had, just had a maturity and a weightiness and a contentment and a joy that our generation likes is because they were forced to have death awareness. Half their kids usually didn't make it. And there was not the hospital system that we have. And loved ones would die usually in their home. So death was always before them. And that does something to you at the core. That's what we're saying. Your heart, your core, your root. As we number our days, we become wise people at the core. And what is wisdom? Over at Abilene Classical Academy, they have these little catechetical character call-outs that they ask questions, and one of them is wisdom. What is wisdom? And I love the, the definition that they give. I can't improve on it. Living skillfully in the fear of God. What is wisdom? Living skillfully in the fear of God. Lord, teach us to number our days that we might live skillfully in the fear of you. Another definition is of wisdom's the ability to make godly choices in life. It's the art of living well, the ability to determine the best, the ability to think, assess, and act and feel according to God's word. Wisdom is that orientation which allows one to live in harmonious accord with God's ordering of the world. It's to be in God's world, God's way. 
It's not just knowledge. Sometimes we make that mistake. Wisdom is just knowledge. No, there's a lot of very knowledgeable people who lack the skill to get anything done, who aren't wise. Wisdom is knowledge applied, lived knowledge of God and his word in his world. Well, how do numbered days, how does numbering our days, how does that lead to skilled living? How does realizing the brevity of life cause us to become wise? Well, really, to ask the questions to answer it in so many ways, isn't it? But let's just consider the opposite of wisdom. What's the opposite of wisdom? Foolishness. The fool does not number his days. The fool gives no consideration to the brevity of life. The fool has no death awareness. The fool shouts YOLO. The fool doesn't take the long view. The fool says in his heart there is no God and then he proceeds to live as if this life is all there is. That's the fool according to scripture. Well, We want the opposite of that. We want wisdom. So how does numbered days lead to wisdom? Let me just mention a couple that are really the same. Numbering our days makes you live in light of the end. Gives you the long view. And numbered days makes you redeem the day. Again, the two are really one. Numbering your days makes you live in light of the end. Realizing that this life is a vapor will lead to wise living. You'll live sold out for Christ. Whatever it is that you're doing, whatever God has called you to, whatever your vocation and job and calling and hobbies, back of that will be a desire to see Christ honored. And you won't get tied up into the things of this world. Here's how 2 Timothy 2 puts it. Share in suffering is a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. Numbering your days, you won't get entangled in fruitless and worthless pursuits. And actually having that prior priority will make you more effective, more wise, more skillful in this world. You know, you hear that phrase sometimes, uh, he's, he's a too heavenly minded to be of any earthly good. That's actually false. No such thing. Listen to the way C.S. Lewis puts it. If you read history, you'll find that the Christians who did most for the present world were just those who thought most of the next. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they've become so ineffective in this. Aim at heaven and you'll get earth thrown in. Aim at earth, you will get neither. Aim at heaven, you'll get earth thrown in. Aim at earth, you'll get neither. Well, numbering our days helps us live in light of the end. Numbering our days also helps us redeem the day. Ephesians 5, redeem the time for the days are evil. Andy Dillard says that our lives consist of our days. And so to redeem the day ultimately leads to redeeming your life, to not wasting your life. How do you not waste your life? Don't waste your days. A fruitful life begins with fruitful days. So win the day, brothers and sisters. Live in light of the end. View your days all of them as opportunities to glorify God and serve people in all you do. Because ultimately, they're not your days. God has them numbered. Ours are days that God has numbered. He has given us. He's given us all a mist. Some of us will have mists that last a little while. Some of us will have shorter mists. You know what our calling is? It's to steward our mist well. Steward your days for his glory. They're his. How can we do that? I think I mentioned it before, but reviving this idea that's not a new idea at all. It's called the rule of life, having a life plan, having a rule of life, a formal plan, a way to build godly habits, daily godly habits with the goal of spiritual formation, spiritual maturation. And if you're like, ah, it's all too formal. No, I'm, I'm spontaneous. You don't like that idea? I would just ask. Maybe that's working for you, but let me just ask, are you happy with where you are? Is it working for you? Your current, you do have a rule of life, maybe not written down, and it may not be intentional, but you have one. And is it working for you? There's business management motto. It goes like this. It says, every system is perfectly designed to produce the results it's getting. 
And so whatever you're doing now, your current rule of life, it's working to get you what you're getting. So if you're not happy with where you are spiritually, things like joy and contentment and love and selflessness, just maybe consider changing your system. What better day to consider changing your system? If you want different results, you might need to change your daily habits. Let me just offer four. So much could be said. But just briefly, four practices for the new year to help you redeem your days and live in light of the ends. First, prayerfully seek wisdom. Wisdom's found in the Word of God this year. Resolve to read the Bible and pray every day. Are you going to miss some days? Absolutely. So what? Keep plotting. Keep plowing. Get a plan. You're going to get behind. So what? Skip ahead, keep plotting, keep plowing. Memorize scripture with us. We're going to make it really easy. To, again, get the app. I think it's four bucks. We're going to have it every week. Join us in memorizing a verse a week. Just think about what we'll be like this time next year. 52 really good verses under our belt. Fighter verses, track three. Meditate on the word, memorize the word, commit. You know, we're a Bible people here at Southside. But I just wonder and worry sometimes as, are we actually a Bible people? And so resolve to be in the word. It is the main means God has given us for spiritual maturation. You got to be in it. Listen to J.C. Ryle. It's a longer quote, but it's good, so I wanted to quote. I think I might have it. I don't know. Do you think you're getting no good from the Bible? It feels that way a lot of times, doesn't it? There's a lot of mornings I read the Bible and close. I don't feel any differently. Maybe a little more sleepy. What does Ralph say? Do you think you're getting no good from the Bible merely because you do not see that good day by day? The greatest effects are by no means those which make the most noise and are most easily observed. The greatest effects are often silent, quiet, and hard to detect at the time they are being produced. Think of the influence of the moon upon the earth. And the air upon the human lungs. Remember how silently the dew falls and how imperceptibly the grass grows. There may be far more doing than you think in your soul by your Bible reading. The word may be gradually producing deep impressions in your heart of which you're not at present aware. Settle it down in your mind. As an established rule, that whether you feel it at the moment or not, you are inhaling spiritual health by reading the Bible and insensibly becoming more strong. Meaning you can't sense it, but settle it down that you are gaining spiritual strength regardless of how you feel when you read God's Word. So, January 1st, get a plan and resolve. Word and prayer every day. Prayerfully read the word of God. Prayerfully seek wisdom. Second, these are all related. Simplify your life around what truly matters. Today we are so busy. We're so distracted. Often too busy and too distracted to live a fruitful and flourishing spiritual life. And so maybe you don't need to worry so much in 2023 about your to-do list or your goals. Maybe you need to make a not-to-do list, a cancel list for 2023. And so what a good time just to reflect on your life and evaluate what are there in your life that you need to eliminate. What is it that you need to start saying no to? That way you can prioritize things that really matter. The monks used to say that every choice involves a renunciation. Every choice is a choice not to do something else. Every choice involves a renunciation. And so simplify your life around what truly matters. Listen to God's word. Galatians chapter 6 verse 7 says this. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the spirit will from the spirit reap reap eternal life. There's two different options when it comes to how we're going to make our choices, how we're going to sow. Sow to the flesh, corruption. Sow to the spirit, 
eternal life, the life of the age to come. Every choice we make is a sowing. And so the question is, what are you sowing to? Again, sorry for the long quotes, but there were just a few good ones. I want to share one from C.S. Lewis now on the importance of these choices, the importance of sowing to the Spirit versus sowing to the flesh. He says every time you make a choice, you're turning the central part of you, the part of you that chooses, into something a little different from what it was before. And taking your life as a whole with all your innumerable choices all your life long, you're slowly turning this central thing either into a heavenly creature or into a hellish creature. Are you sowing to the spirit or are you sowing to the flesh? To be the one kind of creature is heaven. That is, it's joy and peace and knowledge and power. To be the other means, madness and horror and idiocy, rage, impotence, and eternal loneliness. Each of us at each moment is progressing to the one state or the other. There's no neutrality in the world. There's no standing still in the world. We're going one direction or the other, towards the flesh or towards the spirits. Heavenly being, hellish creature, which is it? Daily choices matter. So redeem your day, win the day. Daily choices, even the small ones, right? Especially the small ones, though, because most of your choices are really small. You know, in life, there might be half a dozen choices that are actually big. Our life consists of the small moments. So we need to redeem the small moments. And these habits, they form us over time. It's like a crock pot, not a microwave. Hardly anything in the Christian life happens quickly. Habits form us over time. Again, Ryle says, believe me, you cannot stand still in the affairs of your souls. Habits of good or evil are strengthening in hearts, in your hearts. Every day you are either getting nearer to God or further off. Every day our choices matter. Sow to the Spirit. Don't sow to the flesh. Run every thought. Run every action. Run every relationship. Run every show. Run every song through this Galatians 6 grid. Is this activity, thought, action, person, entertainment? Is this sowing to the spirit or is this sowing to the flesh? Now the way to ask it, is this choice a wise one or a foolish one? Is this activity making me more wise or making me more foolish? Is this thought honoring to Christ or dishonoring to Christ? Does this relationship encourage me in holiness or take me away from it? Does this show produce godly desires or sinful desires? What we give our attention to is the kind of person we become. Your grandma was right. Garbage in, garbage out. Listen to the way Oliver Berkman puts it. What will your life have been in the end but the sum total of everything you spent it focusing on? What will your life be? Again, your life is your days. And here's the thing, it doesn't have to be sin. Hopefully in this room it's not sin. It doesn't have to be sin to move you away from Jesus. Whatever it is, even if it's morally fine, does it move you toward Jesus or away from him? If it's away, then it's not morally fine. But listen to what Hebrews 12 puts it. It commands us. Hebrews 12 commands us to lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. So yes, of course, lay aside every sin, but even every weight that might keep you from running the race well. Run everything through this grid. Simplify your life around what matters most. And in today's world, that means you've got to have dominion over your technology. You can't let your technology have dominion over you. The average American touches their smartphone 2,617 times a day. Barna did a study on millennials. Millennials are 1981 to 1996. Showed on average, millennials spend 2,800 hours a year consuming digital content. But only 153 years of that content is Christian. Who's discipling who there? 2,800 versus 153. 
YouTube, Netflix, TikTok, Twitter, evening news. What we've got to do in today's world is curate our inputs. Curate content for the sake of Christ. And 2 Corinthians 10 would say, take every thought captive to obey Christ. Select valuable content and eliminate triviality. Select encouraging, edifying content and eliminate worldliness. Simplify your life around what matters most. Third, obey Jesus. And specifically, obey him by making disciples. Jesus commanded every disciple to make disciples. It's part of the Great Commission. The way we define discipleship is simply helping others follow Jesus. So I would just ask, are you a disciple of Jesus? And if you say yes then you're commanded to help others follow Jesus. And that, that can look a whole host of ways. But as I say that, are there people in your mind thinking, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to help them, I'm trying to help them, I'm trying to help them. One of the hallmarks of spiritual maturity is when your main joy comes from seeing other people find joy in Christ. In other words, when your main joy is helping others develop spiritually. And so are you involved with that? One of the main ways, you don't have, it's not in the Bible, but one of the main ways that we try to produce that at Southside is through what we call D groups. Maybe you've fallen off, maybe you've never been in a D group. A D group is simply three, four, five men or, or three, four, five women that are meeting together weekly for an hour or so trying to help one another grow. We have a ton of books you can read. They're all on our website. They're all vetted by the elders. You can read a book, a book of the Bible Whatever it may be, where you spend, you get to know someone, someone that's in your life, someone that can ask you hard questions, and you can ask them hard questions. Then you talk about the Word or talk about a God-centered book, and then you pray together, trying to help one another move towards maturity in Christ. If you have a family, make sure you're discipling your family. And men, particularly, God calls you to be the head of the home. Again and again and again through Scripture, men, you're responsible before God to lead your family. So lead them spiritually. Footnote, I was just talking with various parents recently. If you have toddlers, it is normal. And right, in fact, it is normal. I love toddlers, by the way. Aren't they the most hilarious people in the world? <laughs> but it's normal, specifically mom is at home with them. It's normal to feel like all you're doing is spanking. It's just what those years feel like. And Proverbs would tell us that discipline is discipleship. And so persevere. It's a phase. Oh, I can just tell you from personal experience and tell you from God's word, it will pay off. It will pay off. Rebellious toddlers lead to rebellious teenagers and worse. And so nip that in the bud now. The Bible's very clear. I realize I could probably get arrested for saying what I'm saying in about a decade. But Proverbs says, actually, sometimes, you know, I, don't, I could never spank my child. I love them too much. Proverbs says, you hate your child if you spare the rod. And so we want to love our children like God loves us. And one of the main ways to do that is consequences for sin, which in, in toddler life means lots and lots of spankings. <laughs> End of footnote. <laughs> Disciple your home. It's part of discipleship. It's part of discipleship. Because what we're doing when we do that is we're teaching those little ones the goodness of God-given authority. Oh, and that's so vital in those little years. The goodness of God-given authority, which you've got to get then because, listen, that never goes away. Again, so countercultural. Deuteronomy 6 says, parents, you should saturate your home with the word. You shall teach the word of God diligently to your children. Talk of it when you sit, when you walk, when you lay down, when you rise. All the times, word saturation in Christian homes. And Ephesians 6 says much the same as Deuteronomy 6, but it calls out the fathers in particular. Fathers. There's a word for parents. It's not here. It's fathers. Bring up your children in the training and instruction of the Lord. This is a command. It's one of the main commands for fathers. Husbands, love your wives. Fought like Christ loved the church. Fathers, bring up your children in the instruction and training of the Lord with the word of God. And cultivate them. That word for training, that's really what that gets at. That word for training there is this word paideia. It's this idea of enculturation. I love the word. You're building in your home a culture where the word drives and dominates everything. Enculturate your children with the word of God. Bring them up in the instruction of the Lord. Regardless of your educational choices, fathers are commanded to ensure their kids receive a Christian worldview. And so resolve as the year begins, 
to disciple your kids. Resolve to practice family worship. We talk a lot about family worship at Southside. Uh, again, my fear is sometimes we talk about it without practicing it. It's one of those deals where it's easy to lag behind and say, hey, January 1st, what a great time to resolve afresh to get back in the habit of regular family worship. As families, you need to be having meals regularly together around a table with all screens away. What a better time than right there to open up your Bible. Read, pray, sing. Read a scripture. Read from a storybook Bible. We've got all kinds of stuff on our website that's vetted. Normally, you know what's coming on Sunday. We have our song lists in multiple places. Sing songs that we'll be singing. It's just what you do. Again, culture. What is culture? It's what we do around here. The culture of your home becomes, we just read, pray, and sing. Every day we're home and can. Seven days would be amazing. It's pretty unrealistic in many families. Maybe it's four. I don't care. Just practice family worship. Read and pray and sing around a dinner table, in a living room, around a bed, whatever works for you. Also, make plans, mark it off, last week in February to come to our parenting conference. If you've got kids, you want to be there. Chat bet us last week in February. It's going to be a great time. Number three, make disciples. Number four, again, really saying the same thing we've been saying, pursue true happiness. Pursue true happiness. Here we're talking about habits and we're talking about discipline, which is a bad word today. But in God's kindness, discipline leads to delight. Train yourself for godliness, Paul says. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. It's the end of the day. A little job description again for me is... Help my people finish well. Help them die a good death, but also help them say no to the, the broken cisterns of this world that hold no water to say yes to the fountain of living waters. In other words, part of what we do as a leadership of a church is to help you progress in your faith, but also in your joy. This is what we're after at the end of the day. We want you happy, and we know that you're only going to be happy in God. So pursue true joy, true happiness. Numbering your days and living skillfully in the fear of God leads to joy. Obedience is joy. Let me read a little more from Psalm 90. If you've got it open, you can look with me. Just a few verses. The way Moses prays. Psalm 90 verse 12. So teach us to number our days so that we may get a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord. How long? Have pity on your servants Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen evil. What's the goal here? It's joy. It's rejoicing. It's gladness. God blesses obedience. And one of the main blessings of obedience that God gives us it's more of him, a sweeter communion with him who has pleasures forevermore at his right hand. Listen to the way Jesus puts it in John 14. Speaking of the blessing of obedience, he says this, Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. Again, love is obedience as well. Whoever has my commands, that's the one who loves, is the one who obeys Jesus. Whoever has my commands and keeps them, he it is who loves me, Jesus says. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Get that. Those who love Jesus obey his commands. And those who love Jesus, Jesus promises, I'm going to love him, but he has this promise there, I will manifest myself to him. I'm not talking about salvation or being saved or anything like that. Jesus is saying, basically what he's saying to paraphrase is, if you obey me, I'm going to reveal more of myself to you. I will manifest myself. I will show myself. I will reveal more of myself. Do you want more of the Lord? Pursue him in obedience. That's what he promises. I'll make myself known. Obedience leads to more seeing and more savoring of Jesus, which is where joy is found. So those little small choices matter. We sow to the Spirit, and we're increasing our capacity to enjoy God. True happiness is found in wholehearted commitment to Christ. He is where joy is found. 
He said this, these things I've spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. And so, friends, man, buck the trend in Abilene, Texas. Don't be content with half-hearted Christianity. Don't be content with lukewarm faith, neither hot nor cold. One more from Ryle in conclusion. He says this, of all sights in the church of Christ, I know none. More painful to my own eyes, <coughs> more painful to my own eyes than a Christian contented and satisfied with a little grace, a little repentance, a little faith, a little knowledge, a little charity, a little holiness. Also, don't be that kind of person. Rather, let us rather seek every year we live to make more spiritual progress than we've done. To grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. To grow in humility and self-acquaintance. To grow in spirituality and heavenly mindedness. To grow in conformity to the image of our Lord Jesus. So Southside, let's resolve together in 2023 to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom.